Today's episode begins Season 4 of Plants of the Gods, delving more deeply into our most popular topic, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is both a vine and a concoction native to the Northwest Amazon and has been used for thousands of years by indigenous shamans for therapeutic and other purposes. Follow ethnobotanist Dr. Mark Plotkin as he recounts how his mentor Richard Evan Schulte's participatory research on ayahuasca forever changed Western understanding of ayahuasca, shamanism, and the Amazon rainforest. Welcome, everyone, to Season 4 of Plants of the Gods, Hallucinogens, Health, Culture, and Conservation. I'm your host, Mark Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. And to date, we are in the process of crossing the threshold of over a half million downloads, so I'd like to thank everyone. Um, but of all of the episodes we've done in the first three seasons, by far our most popular episode to date has been the one on ayahuasca. So in today's episode, to launch season four, I want to delve a bit deeper into that issue and talk about how my mentor, Richard Evan Schultes, and his search for the ayahuasca vine got us to where we are today. Now, I'm an ethnobotanist by training. I was one of Richard Schultes' final students, and I've been working in and on the plants and peoples of the Amazon for almost four decades. But the more you learn as an ethnobotanist in terms of the rainforest, in terms of the nature, in terms of shamans and shamanic healing, the more you realize you need to know and the more you realize how little you know compared to these brilliant indigenous healers. A 1957 article written by Schultes and published in a small journal in the Harvard Botanical Museum basement on hand-operating printed press changed the world. And that was his description of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, based on a rainforest vine from the jungles of the western Amazon, is today drunk and venerated from Indonesia to Israel to Istanbul. But first, let's frame our discussion within the context of what's happening today with the plants of the gods, hallucinogenic plants and fungi, and even at least one or two hallucinogenic animals are increasingly being mainstreamed into western medicine. Research labs and departments have been established at Harvard, Yale, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, and the Imperial College in London, and more appearing at other universities and medical schools around the world. Meanwhile, Netflix's recent hit series, How to Change Your Mind, was based on the best-selling book on psychedelics and healing written by Michael Pollan. We're now living in what has been termed the psychedelic renaissance. To quote Charles Dickens, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. In terms of psychedelics, it is the best of times. Consider these recent headlines. Ayahuasca, a psychedelic drug brewed by indigenous tribes, can be used to treat depression and alcoholism. The psychedelic revolution is coming, and psychiatry will never be the same. A psychedelic drug boom comes closer to reality. But it is also the worst of times. Other recent headlines. Amazon deforestation, out of control. Fires in the Amazon, out of control. Loss of linguistic diversity may lead to disappearance of unknown remedies unknown to science. To add to Mr. Dickens' famous saying, it is also the weirdest of times. Ayahuasca has so penetrated the public consciousness, it has even appeared in the headlines of The Onion. And I quote, an ayahuasca shaman is dreading yet another week of guiding tech CEOs to spiritual oneness. And even weirder still, this is an actual quote. A tech billionaire was quoted as saying, I took magic mushrooms and it was a life-changing experience. I finally understand Bitcoin. From here, I want to talk a bit more about the scientist who brought ayahuasca and these magic mushrooms to the world's attention. That's my mentor, Richard Evan Schultes. Born and raised into humble circumstances in East Boston in 1915, Schultes was a most unlikely candidate to become the archetypal Amazon explorer, the leading authority on mind-altering plants and fungi, and ayahuasca, as well as a founding father of rainforest conservation. The grandson of German and British immigrants, he was essentially an outsider in a neighborhood dominated by Italians and the Irish, 
a formative experience, in my opinion, that stood him in good stead when he was to spend well over a decade as an outsider amongst indigenous Amazonian peoples. Schultes entered Harvard College as a scholarship student in 1933, intending to study pre-medicine. Since plants and medicines were so deeply intertwined at the time, he took a work-study job at the Botanical Museum on Oxford Street and enrolled in a class on plants and human affairs, taught by the museum director, a fellow by the name of Oaks Ames. After Schultes devoured a book on the hallucinogenic effects of peyote and produced an excellent term paper on the subject for the course, Ames personally funded him to spend a month of the 1936 summer living with a Kiowa and other indigenous groups in Oklahoma. Schultes, who had not previously ventured outside of New England, conducted one of the first field investigations of peyote employed as a healing sacrament by indigenous peoples. He reported that ingesting the cacti had induced experiences and visions, quote, beyond the description of contemporary science, end of quote. Later, while studying peyote in the herbarium, Schulte stumbled across a note attached to a herbarium specimen which claimed that Mexico's Mazatec peoples also ingested mushrooms for divinatory purposes. At the time, no scientist knew of any hallucinogenic fungi consumed by peoples of the Americas. In 1938, Schultes, by now a Harvard graduate student, headed south to Oaxaca in southern Mexico, where he indeed collected magic mushrooms, leading to the scientific discovery of psilocybin. And keep in mind, as we discussed in an earlier episode with Paul Stamets, Stamets calls psilocybin the Einstein molecule for its incredible therapeutic abilities and potential. Still greater exploits lay before Schultes. In 1941, he obtained a grant to study arrow poisons in southeastern Colombia, Amazonia's most remote corner. Shortly after he arrived in Colombia, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and seized the rubber plantations in Southeast Asia. As rubber was deemed an essential strategic warfighting material, the American embassy directed Schultes to stay in the Amazon and search for new disease-resistant, high-yielding strains of natural rubber. Schultes would smile when he recounted this story about being told to go back to the Amazon. This was the equivalent of Br'er Rabbit claiming that he didn't want to be thrown back in the briar patch. Schultes remained in the Amazon for over a decade, conducting the first detailed studies of ayahuasca. He also collected thousands of other medicinal plants, including hundreds of species new to science. In fact, more than a hundred of those specimens and those species are named in his honor. Let's talk a bit more about ayahuasca and its origins. Ayahuasca is first and foremost a woody vine, a liana native to the northwest Amazon, whose scientific name is Banisteriopsis capi. Another common name is yahe. These two names predominate in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, that is the northwest Amazon. The vine is also known as capi amongst the tribes of northwestern Brazil and also commonly known as Huasca in the rest of Brazil. Any of these names may refer to the hallucinogenic potion created by brewing this liana with other plants. The antiquity of ayahuasca use, however, how long the native peoples of Amazonia have been taking this brew is impossible to determine. Schultes wrote, quote, the drink employed for prophecy, divination, sorcery, and medicinal purposes is so deeply rooted in native mythology and philosophy that there can be no doubt of its great age as part of Aboriginal life. End of quote. The American ethnobotanist Constantino Torres, an authority on the history of New World hallucinogens, notes that the Jesuit missionary Jose Chantaireira provided the first known account from the Peruvian Amazon as early as 1675. Quote, the shaman hangs his hammock in the middle or takes himself a bench or small platform and places next to the pot a hellish brew called ayahuasca, remarkably effective at depriving one of the senses. He makes a tea of the vine from bitter herbs, which, after much boiling, becomes very thick as it is so strong to disrupt judgment in small quantities. End of quote. 
The missionary's reaction to this experience was in keeping with the response of most historical ecclesiastic chroniclers, that is, the people of the church, when they encountered mind-altering plants and fungi employed by the indigenous peoples of the New World. The clergy demonized and condemned it. These substances and mixtures, including peyote from the north, which we covered in an earlier episode, magic mushrooms in Central America that we discussed in three earlier episodes, and ayahuasca and yopo snuffs in the Amazon, which were covered in season one of Plants of the Gods, all were subjected to the same dismissive treatment by the missionaries themselves. Equally characteristic is what happened when the first ethnobotanist encountered ayahuasca. He drank it. In 1851, British botanist Richard Spruce stumbled upon an ayahuasca ceremony among Satucanoan peoples on the Valpez River in northwestern Brazil near the Colombian border. After the conclusion of the ritual, Spruce ventured into the surrounding rainforest to collect the vine and flower, which is necessary for making a precise scientific identification. Realizing that this represented a species unknown to science, Spruce named the plant Banisteria copy, thereby honoring and immortalizing the Tucanoa name for the vine, which was copy. The current scientific name is Banisteriopsis copy. There's a complex botanical taxonomic reason for changing the name from Banisteria to Banisteriopsis that I want to delve into here. But the name copy, the name of the species, endures. I will, however, point out something more germane to this discussion in this episode. When Schultes was a child of about 10, he developed a terrible stomach problem and was bedridden for close to a year. His father, Otto, wanting young Richard to continue his education, went to the East Boston Library just four blocks south of their house and checked out a book for him to read and to listen to because his father would read to him at night. That book was Notes of a Botanist on the Amazon and the Andes. This was Richard Spruce's account of his travels in South America in the 1800s, which had been edited and published by Alfred Russell Wallace, who many of you know as the co-creator of the theory of evolution and was a great explorer of the Amazon in his own right. The point I'm making here is that Schultes was hearing about ayahuasca as a 10-year-old, I can assure you that East Boston kids in the 1920s listening to stories about ayahuasca in the Amazon rainforest was limited to a subset of one, and that was Little Richard Evan Schultes. I want to talk a bit about ayahuasca admixtures, which are plants added to the potion with the intention of altering the type, intensity, and duration of the experience. These admixtures represent a complex and fascinating aspect of the story, which is covered in more detail on my most recent book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know. By my count, over 100 different plants from 40 different plant families have been reported as additives to the brew. Although most are flowering plants, at least one is a gymnosperm, you know, like a pine tree, and another is a fern. The two most important admixtures are either the shrub chacruna from the coffee family or the okoyahe from the same family as ayahuasca. And the classic work on these admixtures was done by Homer Pinkley, a former student of Schulte's who worked with the Kofan tribe and just passed away at the end of 2022. Both of these admixtures contain hallucinogenic tryptamines, that is, hallucinogenic chemicals known as alkaloids that often prove inert when consumed orally unless they are activated by the presence of compounds known as monoamine oxidase inhibitors, spelled like it sounds. Scientists, however, shorten it to MAO inhibitors. The point being, how do these indigenous peoples, how did the shamans in a forest of 40,000 species figure out how to combine just two or three of them to get these incredible hallucinogenic and entheogenic effects? In the Amazon, the brew is typically prepared by boiling the stem of the ayahuasca vine with the admixtures I mentioned. This goes on for several hours and produces a thick and severely bitter, did I say severely bitter, brew, which is then consumed in small doses. Nobody who's ever tasted this will forget the taste of it, and nobody's ever tasted this will willingly drink it again just for the taste. About 20 minutes after the initial dose, the subject usually experiences the onset of dizziness and nausea, and then often vomiting or diarrhea. 
These are purges that the shamans insist are the cleansing necessary to initiate the healing process. And I should point out that a lot of shamanic medicine involves purging, whether hallucinogens are involved or not, and say one of the reasons we have as many diseases as we do in Western culture that they don't have is that if you go for life, you take in toxins and you have to find a way to expel them, which is really not part of the way we practice medicine and healing in Western culture. Within an hour of taking the brew, visions commence, often inducing fear, stress, or terror, and frequently followed then by scenes of unsurpassed loveliness and spiritual illumination. Participants in traditional ayahuasca sessions sometimes report the ability to communicate telepathically with the shaman who is guiding the ceremony, so much so that the first alkaloid isolated from the ayahuasca vine was named telepathine. I was recently asked by somebody I just met if I was indeed an ethnobotanist, had I heard of or even drunk ayahuasca? I replied to this question with a smile. I've taken it about 92 times at last count, but I still consider myself a beginner. Now, Amazonian shamans imbibe ayahuasca as the means to diagnose, treat, and cure illness and claim that the potion empowers them to see into the future, ward off misfortune, find lost objects, help with the hunt, and provide protection against jealousy and negativity. Schultes painted a vivid portrait of the shamanic perspective on the potion. I love this quote. Ayahuasca can free the soul from corporal confinement, allowing it to wander free and return to the body at will, the soul thus untrammeled. It can liberate the drinker, from the realities of everyday life and introduce him or her to wondrous realities and permit him or her to communicate with his ancestors. The vine of the soul refers to this freeing of the spirit. The plants involved are truly plants of the gods, for their power is laid to supernatural forces residing in their tissue, and they were divine gifts to the earliest people on earth. End of quote. So where did ayahuasca originate? The question remains unanswered. New research ongoing at Harvard, looking at the genomics of these plants, may give us a concrete answer to the geographic origin. But I think the shamanic origin is in the southern rainforests of Colombia. Let me talk about the Sibandoy Valley. The Sibandoy is a small valley in the eastern slope of the Andes in southern Colombia, which I consider to be the cradle of the ayahuasca culture. The Sibandoy is both a crossroads and a refuge for a variety of reasons. The valley is surrounded by four 12,000-foot volcanoes, meaning it is truly a valley obscured by clouds. The first people who came across the Andes more than 10,000 years ago probably passed through here. The trail from the Pacific coast to the Sibandoy Valley on the eastern slope goes through the lowest pass in the Colombian Andes meaning that the easiest way to get from the Pacific into the Amazon by the first indigenous peoples of the Americas was most easily accomplished in this trail, which leads to the Sibandoy Valley. The Sibandoy is also the source of the Putumayo, which is the major Amazonian river in Colombia. Many people fail to comprehend the magnitude of the Colombian Amazon, the Colombian Amazon rainforest is larger than New England. It is home to an enormous tract of relatively pristine and highly biodiverse rainforest. It is home to many groups of indigenous peoples who live a relatively isolated and traditional existence. Today, however, modernity has begun to press in from all sides. The Sibandoy, though, because it has long been a crossroads between the Pacific and the Amazon, first saw Westerners arrive hundreds of years ago. In fact, the Spanish conquistadors entered the valley in 1534, meaning that these indigenous peoples have been dealing with and resisting the outside world for a very long period of time. Now the valley is being surrounded by mining concessions and roads are appearing all around it. There are two tribes of indigenous peoples in the valley, the Kamsa and the Engano. The Kamsa consider themselves to be the original inhabitants of the valley and therefore possibly the original inhabitants of the Amazon. They speak an isolated language, meaning it's not related to any other known language in South America or elsewhere. The other group is the Ingano, 
who speak a language related to Quechua, the original language of the Incas, still widely spoken in the northern Andes. Still, these two groups have very different origin stories. They have very different languages, but they live in a very similar style in terms of their agriculture, their subsistence, the way they manage the ecosystems, and more importantly for our purposes and for them, the way they manage their plant medicines on a parallel track. Speaking of parallel tracks, I also want to talk about how ayahuasca came to the world through academic society. The Agassiz Museum, now known as the Harvard Museum of Natural History on Oxford Street, just north of Harvard Yard, was founded by scientist Louis Agassiz in 1859. Agassiz was a great teacher, a great lecturer, and in many ways a great scientist, but he had two fatal flaws. He was a terrible racist, and he was an anti-Darwinian. Louis Agassiz organized the Thayer expedition to the Amazon in 1865 during the last month of the Civil War in an effort to find things that would help him disprove Darwin's theory of evolution. However, what would prove more important about the Thayer expedition was not Agassiz and not Darwin. It was William James, today regarded as the father of psychology. Keep in mind that William James, who was merely a student when he went to the Amazon with Agassiz, was a rich white guy who hung out with other rich white guys, and his idea of diversity was to go to Europe and hang out with other rich white guys. But he dropped all that when he went to the Amazon as a student of Agassiz in 1865. There he was working shoulder to shoulder in the rainforest with indigenous peoples, Afro-Brazilians, Brazilian military, Portuguese royalty, and this obviously impacted the way he thought and understood the human mind. If you read William James' biographies and Wikipedia, there's little or no mention of the importance of this Amazonian experience. James went from the mouth of the Amazon all the way to the Columbia border, thousands of miles to the west. There's no proof he took ayahuasca or any of the other mind-altering drugs of Amazonia, but the fact that he was dealing with these other realities and other cosmovisions definitely had an impact on his way of thinking and his understanding of the human mind. In fact, if you ask people about Harvard and hallucinogens, most of them think it all began with Timothy Leary in the 1960s. Many others believe it began with Richard Schultes in the 1930s. But this was not the case. It, in fact, began 40 years before Schultes went to Oklahoma to first study peyote in the 1930s. At the very end of the 19th century, William James took peyote, which is not only overlooked in many of the biographies, but once again not given credit for the impact on his understanding of the human psyche. To be fair and accurate, I want to note that William James did not like peyote or value the experience. In fact, he much preferred nitrous oxide, better known as laughing gas. In fact, William James said he didn't fully understand the German philosopher Hegel until he took nitrous oxide. On a personal note, I inhaled plenty of nitrous oxide when I was in college in the 70s, and I still don't understand Hegel. So where did the ayahuasca vine originate in the Amazon rainforest? I've asked many fellow botanists, but nobody's quite sure. I looked into all the published accounts from the very first missionary account in the 1600s that I mentioned earlier up until Schultes and Siebendoy in 1942. Virtually all of these accounts originate from the northwest Amazon. In 1941, Schultes entered Siebendoy. There he met a legendary medicine man, a taita, which is what medicine men are called in this corner of Colombia. The Taita was named Salvador Chindoy, and it was Chindoy who turned Schultes on, and essentially the rest of the world as well, to the magic and the power and the therapeutic potential of ayahuasca. So here's a question. Why isn't Salvador Chindoy as famous as Maria Sabina, the legendary shaman of the Mexican Mazatecs who turned the world on to magic mushrooms in the 1950s? As we strive to give indigenous peoples their due, I think the name Salvador Chindoy has to be placed in the pantheon of ethnobotany, along with Maria Sabina and the other indigenous healers who were generous enough to share with us some of their healing magic. On a different note, let me point out that Schultes is famous for his ethnobotanical research, but he also had an extraordinary and very impish sense of humor. 
I'm here to tell you that Martin Luther King is not the first person to use nonviolent protest. And let me explain why that's the case. The Catholic Church had long been trying to stamp out the use of ayahuasca amongst the indigenous peoples of Sibindoy prior to Schulte's arrival. When he was departing the valley, Schultes expressed his disdain for this initiative by planting ayahuasca vines all around the Catholic Church. Schultes always championed participation in local rituals and dances and coca chewing and ayahuasca drinking. When invited by indigenous colleagues, teachers, and guides, as he often said, quote, it would be the height of arrogance and rudeness to reject the hallucinogenic snuff when the shaman passes you this snuff pipe or the bowl when the shaman offers you his ayahuasca. Nonetheless, what I call the Schulte's conundrum is that he would always tell people that he never felt the effects of ayahuasca. He never really got off. Quote, all I saw was colors, Bill. That's Schulte's quoted in the Yahi Papers, the famous book on ayahuasca by William Burroughs. This claim that he never felt the effects is demonstrably untrue. Keep in mind that Schultes was a little bit of a trickster in a positive shamanic way, and I can prove it. In one of his more obscure papers, he wrote, quote, It was my good fortune to be able to witness the preparation and to take a different ayahuasca along the Rio Tiquier in northwestern Brazil in 1948. The beverage prepared from the Tetrapterus liana was yellowish in hue, quite unlike the coffee brown color characteristic of all preparations of Banisteriopsis copy that I've seen. A small amount of stem material for chemical study I gathered from the wild, but it was lost in the overturning of my canoe. Consequently, nothing is known chemically about this copy and its highly intoxicating effects, which are very much like those produced by Banisteriopsis. This I can vouch for from self-experimentation, end of quote. So let's go a little further, and I can prove that, yes, Schultes did feel the effects of ayahuasca. About a decade ago, I was visiting Jesus Hidrobo, a very famous South American botanist at his place in Bogota, the capital city of Colombia. And I asked him if Schultes ever got high from the effects of ayahuasca. And he replied, quote, Funny you should ask. One week ago tonight, in that very same chair in which you're sitting, was Pedro Wahibioy, who was Schulte's guide and translator in the Sibindoy. And I asked Pedro the same question. Pedro smiled and said, quote, I was there the night my uncle Salvador Chindoy gave the brew to Schultes for the very first time. And Schultes laughed and he sang and he told stories all night. So what did Schulte say? Idrobo asked. And Pedro looked and said, I don't know. It was all in English. So what's the impact of ayahuasca and ayahuasca alkaloids on the world, on our culture, on our religion? Perhaps the impact of this rainforest vine and its mind-altering alkaloids is greater than we think. A wonderful Israeli ethnobotanist named Benny Shannon always wondered how a man could go into the Sinai Desert and talk to a burning bush. A few years later, Benny went to the Peruvian Amazon, drank ayahuasca, and said, quote, now I understand how a man can talk to a burning bush, but there's no ayahuasca in the Sinai. However, later research revealed that the Syrian rue, which is a common plant in the desert in the Middle East, contains some of the same ayahuasca alkaloids. But ayahuasca, as I've explained, is actually at least a mixture of, of two plants. So despite finding some of those same alkaloids from the ayahuasca vine in the Syrian rue bush, some of the chemicals were still missing. But then it was realized that the acacia tree, which is again common in the Sinai, contains those other alkaloids. If you know your Bible, or if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you're familiar with the Ark of the Covenant. It is the most sacred relic of the ancient Israelites, said to contain the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. The Ark of the Covenant, according to the Bible, was made from two substances, gold and acacia wood. Of course, this is not proof that ayahuasca alkaloids played a formative role in the birth of Judaism or Catholicism, but it's definitely something worth pondering. And it's yet another example of why the study of plants and indigenous peoples is endlessly fascinating. But what became of Richard Evan Schultes after his groundbreaking work in the Amazon, after his decade in the rainforest and a half in these jungles, studying and collecting plants of power and healing? 
He returned to Harvard in the 1950s, eventually becoming the Botanical Museum director and actually teaching the Plants and Human Affairs course in which he was once enrolled. There, Schultes created one of the most electrifying classrooms in Harvard history. This was the famous Nash Lecture Hall in the upper reaches of the museum, bedecked with demon masks, Amazonian dance costumes, opium pipes, blowguns, poison-tipped arrows, and herbarium specimens of hallucinogenic species. Many ethnobotanists passed through that classroom and had their lives changed forever. It certainly happened to me. It happened to Wade Davis. It happened to Andrew Weil. It happened to Timothy Plowman and to many, many others as well. Meanwhile, Schulte's books, lectures, and photographs elevated him to cult hero status amongst those intrigued by alternate realities and deeply influenced writers like Alejo Carpentier, William Burroughs, Carlos Castaneda, and Aldous Huxley, and personalities as diverse as biologist E.O. Wilson and beat poet Allen Ginsberg, who both hailed Schultes as their personal hero and inspiration. Schultes always believed that psychedelic substances could be powerful additions to the Western medicine chest, a prediction borne out by the development of cardiac beta blockers derived in part from compounds extracted from the mushrooms he encountered in southern Mexico. He also foresaw that hallucinogens could facilitate better understanding and more effective treatment of the human psyche. His prediction has proven startlingly prescient. Today, we're living in the psychedelic renaissance as mind-altering substances offer significant promise in the treatment and potential cure of addiction, depression, PTSD, and other challenging afflictions. Schulte's scientific output was prodigious, as I said. He collected more than 24,000 plant specimens, including hundreds new to science, and published more than 450 scientific articles. Adding to his legacy, he was amongst the first to point out that both the rainforest and the indigenous cultures that knew them best were increasingly threatened, and that these societies and their botanical wisdom were disappearing, in fact, much faster than the rainforest itself. In 1943, Schultes traveled to Chiribiquete, an exceedingly remote region of tabletop mountains in the northwest Amazon that had been preliminarily mapped by the eccentric Harvard geographer Hamilton Rice in 1907. I'll put a profile I wrote of Hamilton Rice in the show notes. Schultes returned to the capital city of Bogota and began advocating with Colombian colleagues for the government to declare Chiribiquete a protected area, which finally came to fruition in 1989. Schultes retired from Harvard in 1985, but continued to speak and publish widely on the importance of rainforest and indigenous wisdom before passing away in 2001. Meanwhile, Chiribiquete has been expanded several times. It is now twice the size of Massachusetts, making it the world's largest rainforest national park, home to stunning levels of biodiversity and protecting three uncontacted indigenous groups, as well as the world's largest repository of pre-Columbian paintings and lots of ayahuasca vines. In terms of rainforest conservation, ayahuasca, psilocybin, mescaline, greater respect for indigenous wisdom, and better appreciation of nature's therapeutic bounty, particularly the plants of the gods, the legacy of Richard Evan Schultes lives on. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to give us a good rating and to subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team. In our next episode, join Dr. Plotkin and Brian Murarescu, author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Immortality Key, in the first of a two-part discussion where we'll hear about the role psychedelics have played in the creation of both Western civilization and Christianity, and much more.